Brother Stacy, you come. You pray for him while he comes. <clears throat> Thank you, Pastor. I appreciate God's goodness, don't you? Amen. And the feeling is certainly mutual. I don't know where we could go and enjoy any better singing than what we've been able to receive. And um, I want to thank you for just letting me unload what's in my heart and to uh, did I do something wrong brother John oh. and at least whether you're sincere or not acting like you appreciate <laughs> I do appreciate it so very much thank you deeply I'm so hopeful and expectant for this church. I don't know where you could go and find any more beautiful families and with the heritage that you have and the solid foundation in the belief in the gospel and your openness to the Spirit of God and then having a man of God is paramount. Now I can't say this in my own place without appearing to be self-serving but I've found through the years that if a church is going to have the blessing of heaven uh, then they've got to secure a man of God before them. God comes with a God called man. Heaven comes with a God called man. God's blessing. I just want to say it again in case you ain't getting it. God's blessing comes with a God called man. There are multiple examples of that in the Scripture. There, one is sufficient for me that when God called Moses to Egypt, there was a time in his life when Moses tried to do something for God. He saw a need. But then many years later, after God had let him die, and God had schooled him in the ways of the Spirit. Moses got a call. Amen, and there's a vast difference in seeing a need and having a call. Amen. Amen. And when he went back to Egypt, he had all the backing of heaven. Yeah, and things began to unfold down in Egypt that they'd never heard of or seen. They had flies, they had bulls, the water turned to blood, they had, but didn't they have lice? Yeah. You say, well, what's so great about that? That doesn't seem like that's very special. Well, if you're a Jew, it means a lot. Yeah. <laughs> it was all indications of God coming to the land. And God was assassinating the gods of Egypt and showing them that He is superior. Amen. So I, I thank God for it. And you've got everything, the recipe for making a mark for God right here in this place, as you have, I'm sure, and in days ahead. I, well, we're eating. Uh, here in a little bit, as the old folks used to say, directly. <laughs> Took me a long time to figure out what they were saying. <laughs> I think I learned it in one of those books you pick up at Cracker Barrel, How to Speak Redneck. Y'all seen those? <laughs> directly. 
I guess the good thing about having dinner on the premises is you ain't got to try to rush and hurry and get out. I know that I, I'm full. I feel like I'm leaving and with a sense of having been ministered to, and I want to thank you for that. Amen. It's not all about just coming and receiving. Uh, when I go to places, I'm... I'm on the lookout for how God's going to speak to me and channel into my life through His people. The shepherd uses His people in my life. Amen. Just the way sometimes you can look. A response, an expression, a word, a kindness. I take that as tokens of the Lord manifesting Himself to me. And loving me and I thank God for it. I want you to turn with me then to Philippians chapter 4. Philippians chapter 4. I'm going to use one very familiar text. Verse 13. But I hope that God will never let you see this text the same again. And more than that, to see the divine truth that is articulated in these inspired words. In Philippians 4, verse number 13, every one of you know the verse. But I wonder if the truth of it is being realized and experienced in your life. I want to talk with you just for a few minutes as God would help me. We'll see if we make any progress or not. If we don't, we'll just drop our landing gear and pull on up into the terminal. Get a bite to eat. But here's what he said. I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. I want you to think with me for just a few minutes about the secret of supernatural living. Mm -hmm. Supernatural living. God energized living. Spirit filled living. Heavenly imparted strength lifestyle. I was reminded again. Earlier this year, my son was married in the spring and went with him on one occasion to look at some rings. And I'd forgotten about it because it had been about 26, 27 years ago since I'd done that. That those jewelers would take that, that sparkling diamond and in order to enhance it or maybe to impress you more, Really, the word is to entice you. They'll put that diamond against the backdrop of some kind of a cloth to kind of set it apart, help you see its brilliance even clearer. Mm -hmm. Philippians 4.13 is just such a text. I think we miss the truth of what God is saying to us in this verse if we do not see it in its context. I heard years ago that a text taken out of context is a pretext. And everything that Paul says around this verse gives it all the meaning that I think that we should draw from it. He's calling, at least in this chapter, for a life that is really beyond their ability. There are responsibilities, there are duties that Paul is bringing to their attention as Christian people that that really doesn't come natural. Uh, You say, what do you mean? Look at verse number 1. Let's just start here. He, He says in verse number 1, My brethren, dearly beloved, and long for... My joy and crown, he said, so stand fast in the Lord, my dearly beloved. 
to hold the ground that you have attained. That's a real challenge in these days, isn't it? Amen. To maintain, uh, to hold on to what God has given you. I think it throws us back to what He had just been calling for in Philippians chapter 3, to pressing on, following on, that you may know the Lord, and uh, to obey everything that you've been obeying. It's an interesting text in verse number 16, Philippians 3, 16. Or rather, verse 15, he said, As many as be perfect, let us be thus minded. And if in anything you be otherwise minded, God shall reveal even this unto you. Nevertheless, whereto we've already attained, let us walk by the same rule, let us mind the same thing. Amen. Whatever it is that has brought you to where you are in God and in His grace and in your knowledge of God and in your Christian experience, if you've made any progress at all, Paul says those are the things that ought to be continued. And wherever you have attained to, that's the command in verse number 1. So stand fast in the Lord. Don't back up. Hold your ground. I want to tell you, in an hour when the pressure is on and all of hell is being unleashed against the truth of God and against His people, mm -hmm. that is a real challenge. Right. And it doesn't come natural. It requires supernatural strength. That's right. Look at what he said in verse number 2, even more. He said, I beseech you, Odeus, and I beseech Syntyche, that they be of the same mind in the Lord. Now, these must have been two uh, known women in the church. Harry Ironside gave them the nickname of Bad Odor and Soon Touchy. You odious and syntiki. Whatever, we don't know what the issue was, but something had come up between these two, two dear precious ladies. I don't know, maybe one Sunday... You odious came with a new dress from Belk's department store and, and Syntyche wasn't there that Sunday and she showed up the following Sunday with the same dress. Yeah. That just doesn't go over, does it? As the old feller said that Cox pistols, don't you? Yeah. <laughs> Somehow they'd come into a disagreement among themselves. Yeah. Must have been important. It always is, isn't it? whatever breaks down fellowship between God's people. But Paul's appeal is be of the same mind in the Lord. You ought to think toward one another like God thinks toward that individual. That doesn't come natural. With that in mind, that makes this text, Philippians 4.13, even more attractive. I can hear one of them saying, I just don't know, I just don't think I can love that woman. But Paul says, hold on, hold on, hold on a second, can I testify? I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. Look at what he said, I'm just showing you, we'll get somewhere in a moment, I just want you to see this, it I think really uh, establishes the truth. He says in verse number 4, um, rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. All the way rejoice in the Lord. A life of gratefulness and joy and victory. I want to tell you, it's just so easy to get negative, isn't it? And to grumble. And to complain. To whine. I heard a story some time ago about a, a fellow that had taken a vow of silence and had moved into a convent somewhere. I guess, isn't that where these, these folks, I don't know, I'm not Catholic, you forgive me. But um, he'd taken a vow of silence and he was allowed to speak two words every ten years. He came before the abbot. The abbot said, what do you have to say? And he, his first two words after two years was, food bad. He stayed another 10 years. The abbot called him in, let him speak another two words, and he said, 
bed hard. After 30 years, he was allowed to speak two more words. He came before the abbot and he said, I quit. The abbot said, it doesn't surprise me. He said, all you've done is complain since you've been here. 30 years of it. Oh, it's so easy to see this or to see that and to grumble about this about the church or to grumble about this that's going on in our lives and to forget that the favor of God is upon us and that we are the people of God by faith in Jesus Christ. And Paul says to rejoice in the Lord. You've got to understand, Paul wasn't in the best of circumstances when he wrote the book of Philippians. Somebody said he may have been in the dungeon when he wrote the book of Philippians, but thank God he wasn't in the dumps because he keeps talking about how he rejoices and he enjoys in God and he rejoices in all the things that God is doing, both seen and unseen. It doesn't come natural. It's just so easy. I don't like it. He says in verse 5, Let your moderation be known unto all men that the Lord is at hand. A God consciousness. That, that doesn't come natural. Sometimes I think we live like practical atheists. Like there is no God in our life. In verse number 6, Worry. Be careful for nothing. That is, don't be anxious. Well, we're an anxious generation, aren't we? Nervous generation. Antsy. Short. Fused. Generation. Be careful for nothing, Paul says. But be prayerful for everything. Let your requests be made known unto God. And the peace of God will keep your hearts. Oh, that doesn't come natural. That takes an infusion of supernatural life and supernatural power. Look at verse number 8. What about your thought life? Everything that's true, everything that's honest, everything that's just, everything that's pure, whatever's lovely and out of a good report and virtuous, and if there's anything praiseworthy in it. Paul said, fix your mind on these things. Well, there's where the real battle rages, isn't it? It's in the mind. That doesn't come natural to have a proper and an acceptable thought life. It takes supernatural power. He says in verse number 9, whatever you've seen, learned, received, and heard in me, he said, do it. Do it. He talks about there uh, in verse number 12, I know how to be abased and I know how to abound. In any situation, Paul says, I know exactly how to to make it and I'm sustained and I'm content and satisfied in it. That just doesn't come natural, folks. And against all these expectations and this appeal is set this promise, I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. Now look at it. There are three simple principles I want to bring to your attention and I'll be finished. The first thing is simply this. Supernatural living depends on the activity of Christ in my life. The activity of Christ in my life. Paul is talking about what God is doing, what Jesus is doing, what the Holy Ghost is doing in His life that qualifies him and enables him for any situation. He says it's all the result of what Jesus is doing. I read a statement years ago that stuck in my heart. G. Campbell Morgan, the great Bible expositor, said on one occasion, not by all that I can do can I do anything for God. And I think it would be a blessed experience for you and for me to accept the reality that we just can't do it. Amen. And that's hard on us independent, self-reliant individuals, isn't it? There's something about us. I think if you are 
a, a man. You, you, you're going to do all you can do to see that it gets done, especially in regard to your family or your church or to your job. You, you're going to expend yourself and you're going to push yourself. And yet it seems like it still is not enough. Oh, not by anything that we can do can we do anything for God. And the reality is we must have His work if we are going to do His work. Earlier in the book, Paul said in Philippians 2, verse number 12, he said, work out your own salvation. With fear and trembling, he said in verse 13, for it is God which worketh both to will and to do of His good pleasure. I want to thank God this morning that now for almost 35 years there's been a man in my garden. The Lord Jesus Christ is inside of me and He works when I can't work. And He works and does what I can't do. You know what it takes to live the Christian life? This is going to shock you. Hold on. You ain't going to believe it. It's going to take Jesus. It's going to take the activity of a living Lord in your life. I've, I've heard people say through the years, when you try to talk to them about the Lord and the things of God, I've heard them say, Preacher, I just, I just don't think I can do it. And I used to try to reason with them, but I, from now on I just agree with them. And I say, you know what, you're exactly right. You can't do it. But oh, thank God for the fullness of the blessing of the gospel. Amen. That it announces this. Paul said in Philippians chapter 1 verse number 6, He that hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. Amen. Oh, I hold to the perseverance of the saints, but this morning the reason I rejoice and thank God for that is not so much the perseverance of the saints as it is the perseverance of the Savior. Amen. He just isn't going to quit. He just keeps on keeping on. And you see it in the book of Acts. There what you have on exhibition. And I know the title of the book is the Acts of the, Liv of the, the Apostles, but really the title should be the Acts of the Living Lord through His Apostles. Amen. What you see is a church that is invigorated, a church that is moved upon, a church that has become filled, a church that has become indwelt, a church in whom the living Lord is active and accomplishing His purposes in the earth. Now, the primary activity of God that accomplishes supernatural living is this, His filling. Notice the text says, I can do all things through Christ. Here's His action. Here's His work. Here's what must be done for a supernatural life. An impartation of divine strength and power that's not ours. Amen. That comes from heaven. Amen. You know, it ought to bless us and encourage us this morning to realize that everything that God demands, along with it comes His enablements. All of God's commandments are accompanied with God's enablements. Amen. There's nothing under gospel administration that is expected and required of you and me that is not accomplished by the activity of a living Lord inside our life as His habitation. The text could really be read like this. I heard a dear man say this 30 years ago. I can do all things through Christ who keeps pouring His power into my life who keeps giving what I need, who keeps pouring out. Does that not sound like the promise of the Old Testament? I will pour my water upon him that is thirsty and that is need, that will put in his order for it. God, I need an outpouring. I need renewal. I need a fresh touch. I need fresh anointing. I need divine strength to meet this hour. 
this demand that's upon my life, oh God. I want to tell you something, folks. It takes the power of God in these hours to stay pure, to stay holy, to stay right, to stay faithful, to stay worshipful, to stay grateful. Oh, let me plead and appeal to you this morning. The enemy's shrewd. He's doing everything he can to deplete us of the, the slightest vestige of strength to put and invest ourselves into the things of God. We come drag it into church and we don't even have the energy to look up to heaven. You know why? The enemy's had us so preoccupied with this and preoccupied with that that we haven't taken time to be holy. We haven't taken time to wait on God. If you're going to have peace, if you're going to have strength and power and victory, if you're going to have faith that overcomes the world, we're going to have to look up to heaven and we're going to have to be receiving what God is giving. And the activity of God that enables supernatural living is His filling, His outpouring. Infusing into you and me what comes from heaven. I don't tell you, if God gets out of me what He's wanting out of me, He's going to have to put it in me. You know, I was thinking this weekend, what you said last night, just like a barbed arrow in my heart. To be filled, you've got to yield. I've thought about that through the night and this morning. God has got to do a work. God's going to have to move upon us. And He is. And he will. Paul said about his life and ministry, he said, I'm striving according to his working, which worketh in me mightily. These dear folks have been telling us all week long, when I can't, he can. When I won't, he will. He's a faithful Lord. I'm glad I got a salvation this morning. Thank God that works me up and I hadn't got to pump it up. It's everlasting life. It's eternal life. Hallelujah. When hell comes by and knocks you off your feet, knocks the spiritual wind out of your sails, and all you can do is lay there and look up to God. Oh, just wait. He'll get around to you after a while. And Job said, though a just man fall, yet... Shall he rise seven times? I'm glad there's a life in me that's greater than what's in this world. Greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world. The activity of Christ. And I say to you, number two, I think this text informs me that it depends not only on the activity of Christ in my life, but supernatural living requires the ability of Christ in my life. I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. There's power. There's ability. I, for years I've read this text and it kind of wounded me. It kind of hurt my feelings. But the Lord Jesus said in John 15, verse 4 and 5, He said, Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, listen, He said, Except it abide in the vine. And it's these four words that just hurts my feelings. He said, No more can you. You can't do it. I, I tell you, I've been so turned off this philosophy, this mentality that, that the Christian life is a matter of imitating the Lord. I, I tell you, Hollywood's better than that than I am. They get Oscars for putting on a show. I get, ain't that what they get? I don't know. I can't keep up with all this. 
I mean, they get awards for their performances. Acting. Presenting themselves what they really aren't. I lived in a part of the state in North Carolina near Siler City. Some of you older folks will remember Siler City. How many of you remember Siler City? Yeah. Well, let me ask you this. Has anybody ever heard of Andy Griffin? All right. They always talked about Siler City. I pastored just down the road from Siler City. I was amused to find out that, that Aunt Beef, was her name Frances Baby? Is that her name? She retired and lived in Siler City till she died. But nobody liked her. The story has been told that even the butcher at the grocery shop hated to see her coming up the aisle. She was such a booger. You say sweet little Aunt B? Oh, they said she was a monster. I was shocked. Sweet, innocent, precious little Aunt B, what are you saying? What I'm saying is she put on a good show. But that's not what she really was in real life. The Christian life's going to take more than you and me imitating Jesus. Following His example, it's going to take His endless life. Paul said to the Colossians, the only hope you have is Christ in you. If God gets out of me what He wants out of me, He's going to have to do it. Now, I tell you, I, I'll be 48 next, next, this week. This week, today's Sunday, by the end of the week. And I, I still, for some reason, I still see myself as that 18-year-old boy everywhere I've ever been. My whole life, I've always been the youngest preacher in the room. But that's not the case anymore. And I'm finding out that I can't perform physically as I used to. And I know some of you think, you're just a pup. What are you saying? What are you talking about? I know, I understand. Where you're at, that you'd, you, you'd trade places anytime. But I'm older than I've ever been. <laughs> so that's big for me. I just can't do it anymore. Well, I used to love to play basketball, and now my legs hurt, John. 200 and something pounds is none of your business. It's hard to get it up and down. <laughs> and that pounding on my knees, my shins, boy, I, I just feel it, don't you? Yeah. And I don't tell you something, I am not much of a basketball player. And I'll tell you, if Michael Jordan lived inside of me, what do you think I could do? Brother, I'd get it done. (laughs) (laughs) Amen. Oh, I'm not much of a musician. I can't hardly pick anything. I can't even play a radio. But if Mozart lived inside of me, there'd be some music being made. And I am not holy, but the Holy One inside of me produces holiness. (laughs) I cannot pray, but the spirit of adoption that's inside of me cries out, Abba, Father. God, praise me. I don't pray. That's always been God's way with us. The only chance you ever had of getting saved is God pushing you out of the way. Amen. 
You say, what do you mean? 2,000 years ago when God saw that we couldn't say our, save ourselves, what did He do? He put our substitute on an old rugged cross. He bore our shame, our sin, the judgment and the wrath of God in our place, in our stead. He who knew no sin became sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in Him. God did it for us when we couldn't do it for ourselves. And that principle abides today. It's the same not only in the matter of salvation, but in the matter of sanctification. For you and I to be what God has in mind as His people, you know what He's done? He's pushed us out of the way. And you know what He's done? That same Jesus that He put in our place to save us is the same Jesus that He puts inside of us to make us what God has in mind for us to be. I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. His ability. Now He can handle the Christian life. Thank God he can. <laughs> and in me, he can handle it. In you, he can handle it. I'll tell you something, some folks I don't like. Have you ever met anybody like that? But I love them. He said, what in the world are you talking about? Hey, some folks that instinctively they rub you like sandpaper. They rub you wrong every way they turn. But the Christ that lives in me still reaches out in affection and care and concern. His ability. (laughs) His ability. Now there's one more. Not only supernatural living require the activity of Christ in my life, the filling activity. Not only does supernatural living require the ability of Christ in my life, the supernatural living requires and depends on the accessibility of Christ to my life. If God's pouring something out, He's got to have a vessel that's receiving it. I was thinking, you know, we preachers, we say this, we've all said it and you've all heard it all your life. You know, some of the best ability is availability. Boy, that's good, isn't it? And that's true. And dependability is a good ability, isn't it? You can't do anything else, at least thank God you can be dependable. Or you can be available. I know some dear folks in my church, it it doesn't matter whatever you say, whatever you ask, whatever needs to be done, brother, you know, could you? Yes, sir, preacher. And really, there's a couple of them that ain't the best of Sunday school teachers, but I want to tell you something, they'll just flat get in there and you can't stop them. They'll just stay with it. They'll just keep getting at it and keep working at it and keep on giving. There's something to be said about dependability and availability. But oh, I think in these days that the best ability is fillability. Are you fillable? You say, what do you mean? How are you fillable? God can't fill anything that's not made available and laid out there in front of Him at His disposal. Here's what the Old Testament said. The psalm. God said, open your mouth wide. He said, I will fill it. Well, we're shut off in these hours. Sometimes maybe not even intentionally. We got so much in us that's occupying us. 
that's controlling us and filling us and overtaking us, our minds, our lives, our affections, our energies, that we just don't have anything left to lay out there in front of God and say, Lord, here I am. But God said, open your mouth wide. And He said, I will fill it. There's an openness that must be presented to the Lord. And God said, I'll fill it. Just to be fillable. Fillable. This is our part. If we're going to know His power being poured into our lives, then we're going to have to be open and accessible to what's coming out of heaven. I've met some closed people in the church. Have you? In my years. I mean just shut off to other people. Shut off to their spouses. Shut off to their children. Shut off to anything and everything that's around them that can be of any benefit and more than that. Shut off to God. They're closed up. The shades are pulled down. The lid's put on. And they're just not able to take anything in, to receive anything. Oh, hear me this morning. If God gets out of us what it is that He wants out of us here at Copperas Branch and yonder in Burke County, North Carolina, we're going to have to be open and receptive to what's coming out of heaven. I'll close with this thought. The secret to the Christian life. God has not left. It's not my responsibility to live the Christian life. Can I set you free this morning? Quit trying and start taking. Quit trying and start taking. The old timers used to say, let go and let God. Let God have His wonderful way. Living the Christian life is not my responsibility. But it's my response to His ability. His ability. He can get praying done. He can get preaching done. He can get loving done. But you know what? He can get holiness done. (laughs) I mean, if you're going to be holy, what do you think you're going to do that's going to impress God? I'm glad He can get faithfulness done. He just doesn't quit. (laughs) You think that Energizer Bunny something? i got something in me more than that. It's called eternal life. And you know what? It just keeps going and going and going and going and going and going. The primitives used to sing that song. Thank God it's never gone out. The flame has flickered, but the fire's never gone out. It's His life in my life. And that's the Christian life. Would you bow with me? I'm through preaching. I appreciate your patience. Pastor, you come. All right, buddy, sing it. Yeah.